Let's take our Bible and turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 11. 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Uh, if you need to use one of the pew Bibles there in front of you, be sure and take one of those and turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 11. We'll look at one verse in particular. Then we'll have a lot of scripture on the screen for you this morning, so you'll probably find yourself, instead of flipping back and forth through your Bible, you'll probably find yourself looking up on the screen for the scripture so you don't get lost and, and miss something. I encourage you to take notes this morning. A lot of things that um, I believe we need to hear in preparation for the Lord's Supper. Today is the fifth Sunday. God laid it on my heart a long time ago. Uh, probably I was in Vermont or I was either at Midway to at least have the Lord's Supper every fifth Sunday. And what that does, that holds us accountable as a church to have it at least four uh, times a year. And, and then maybe add Christmas or Easter to that. So you have it five or six times a year at least. And I, I don't believe you can have it too much, do you? Uh, I mean, as often as we do this, we're proclaiming the Lord's death until he comes. So today we are, it, it is the fifth Sunday. We would normally do it on Sunday night. But because of community groups and we've got a lot of people meeting in homes on Sunday night, I moved it to Sunday morning and I'll give you some instruction about what that looks like. So as you can tell, God laid some wonderful music on Brother Phil's heart, and he led us in worship, the choir, and it's just been good to be here. But if you've noticed, we've been singing about the blood, we've been singing about freedom and salvation, the sacrifice, the cross, and we want to continue that mindset through the message all the way up until we go to the table in just a few moments. And I want to tell you, I'm excited about this happening on Sunday morning. Since I've been here with you, I've wanted to have the Lord's Supper on Sunday morning. Uh, I just, uh, I like having it on Sunday night, um, but I, I wanted to make it available to you on Sunday morning. So here we are, and uh, we'll, we'll look at the Word of God, then we will go uh, to the table in just a few moments. If I look a little red, I went fishing Friday. But uh, a couple people told me I've had coon eyes and, and uh, raccoon eyes, but God's good, and I get to tell you about Jesus today. Let's pray, and then I want to read that one verse of Scripture to you, and I want to explain to you. I want to stay close to my notes this morning. I uh, just feel led to do that because I feel great responsibility this morning to teach you the importance of understanding what the table means, what the Lord's table means. So I want to follow my notes carefully and um, want to stay on task. It's going to be, I always say this, but somehow I end up preaching. Um, but today you will notice that I'm teaching a lot and preaching because I want to get a lot of information to you and I want to stay on track because I believe God's given me this and I want to stay on track. So let's pray together. We'll get started. It's good to see you. I love you. Jesus loves you. He's Lord. There is no other. Amen. So we're here to worship him. And, and guys, I want to tell you something. We're going to the table together in just a few moments and just be thinking about it. Let God convict you. Let God reveal unconfessed sin. Maybe um, it's a problem that's going on with uh, a family member, a friend that you need to reconcile before you come to the table. Let God speak to you this morning. So you pray as I pray. God, op just say something like this. God, open my heart so I can, I can receive your word. Okay, God, open my ears so I can hear. So you pray as I pray. Father, here we are. And God, we go to the book with great reverence and honor with great dependence upon you because, Lord, again, we recognize unless your Spirit help us, helps us to understand it, God, we will be listening and preaching in vain. But, God, I know, I know you want us to hear it. God, I pray that you will change our want to, Lord. If we are, have come in here out of routine or we've come in here not really listening, God, help us to listen. Lord, help us to pay attention. God, help us to be aware of your presence that's here with us today. And God, I pray that we would leave changed. I pray for that person that doesn't know you. God, save them today. Change their life forever. And I pray this in Jesus' name. I am nothing without you. I need you every single hour. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 26 says says this, it says, For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Now, what God kind of birthed in my heart this morning is this. Throughout this week, as I started thinking about the Lord's Supper, we always talking about, and Jesus is always talking about, the remembrance of the Lord's Supper. 
the remembrance of the Lord's Supper. We remember the Lord's Supper whenever we come. We remember the body that was broken for us. We remember the blood that was shed for us at Calvary, and we should. But I want you also to understand that we are making a proclamation that the God that we belong to is a redeeming God. And when He is a saving God, and I want us to understand that whenever we take the Supper, the Lord's Supper, in just a few moments, we are proclaiming the Gospel. We're proclaiming it. And that's kind of the focus. What are we proclaiming? What are we, whenever we take the Lord's Supper as a body of Christ, what are we telling the world? And you know, wait, you say, well, there may be skeptics here, Brother Brandon, on a Sunday morning. They may be unbelievers here on a Sunday morning. You know what the Scripture says about it? And it's sad. Let me just go ahead and say it. It's sad when churches get away from the Lord's Supper because they're worried it may offend the unchurched or the unsaved. You know what Jesus says? Let it proclaim me to the world. Let it proclaim me. Let it tell the story of the body and the blood that was given for the remission of sin. So what we pray for today is those that don't understand, those that may be skeptics or you're not going to partake, I pray that you'll watch the Christian partake and you'll understand that we are proclaiming the, uh, the Jesus that we belong to, to you. Okay, so what are we talking about this morning? What are we proclaiming? Let me read a couple things. In our faith and message statement, as a, uh, as a body of believers, here's what we believe. The Lord's Supper is a symbolic act of obedience whereby members of the church, through partaking of the bread and the fruit of the vine, memorialize the death of the Redeemer and anticipate His second coming. There's two ordinances that we partake of, or we, we participate in. The Lord's Supper and baptism. We must be doing both. The Lord's Supper and baptism. If you want to know what we believe in this church, if you want to know what Christians believe, we believe in the body and the blood of Jesus Christ. We believe that He came into this world as God in human flesh. We believe He shed His blood on the cross as a sacrifice for our sin, as a sacrifice which satisfied the justice of God. He paid the penalty in full, and by faith in Him, His death can count to you as a benefit, and it can take your sin away if you put your faith in Him. That's why it's important. That's what we believe. Exodus chapter 12, uh, I believe this may be on your screen. All the way back, you know the Passover, whenever the, the death angel came and it was the last plague in Egypt that God would strike the firstborn and he told the children of Israel to take blood and put it over the doorpost and the death angel would pass over as a symbolic act of the blood being applied. My friend, if the blood's not applied to your life, you will pay for your sin because Jesus has not been applied to you and it's not accounted to you as righteousness. The blood must be applied. The blood has to be applied. Just like this, and all the way back through Passover, little children would come up to their parents and say, why are we doing this? Why are we going through this service? And there's children, I pray, in here today wondering, what is this? And you, you as a parent can look at your child, or maybe you as an unbeliever can understand why we do this. Looking at, or, or let me read Acts, Acts, Exodus chapter 12, verse 25 through 27. And when you come together in the land that the Lord will give you, as He has promised... You shall keep this service. And when your children say to you, what does this service mean? You shall say to them, it is the sacrifice of the Lord's Passover, for He passed over the houses of the people of Israel and Egypt. For He struck the Egyptians, but spared our houses. For the people bowed their heads and worshipped. And then on down in verse 13, chapter 13, verse 8, you shall tell your sons on that day that it is because of what the Lord did for me that I came out whenever I came out of Egypt. Guys, I want to tell you something. Whenever I walk up there in just a few minutes with my beautiful wife and I take the Lord's Supper, you know what I'm going to be doing? I'm going to be telling all of you and I'm going to be telling Taylor and I'm going to be telling all of my children, look at what God's done for us. Look at what God's done for us. It is a memorial, but it's also a witness. It is a remembrance because it is a proclamation. We proclaim the Lord. This is a strong word to proclaim. It means to preach. You didn't know you was coming to church this morning to preach, did you? Well, come on up here. It's time for you to preach. No, listen to me. I'm serious. 
We're all going to be proclaiming. All Christians just walking in fellowship with God. Whenever you take the Lord's Supper, you're going to be proclaiming the Lord's death until He comes. It is a strong word. Matthew chapter 26, 26 through 29. Now as they were eating, Jesus took the bread and he, after He blessed it, He broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is My body. And He took the cup after He had given thanks and gave it to them saying, Drink of it, all of you, for this is My blood in the co- uh, of the covenant is which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the day, that day when I drink it anew with you in My Father's house. It is amazing. You know, all those thousands of years of Passover was kind of like the Lord's Supper before the Lord's Supper, and then Jesus came and instituted the, Lord, the Passover to the Lord's Supper. Guys, do you understand what we're doing this morning has been happening in the Christian atmosphere for thousands of years? Tell me something or some country or something that's lasted that long. And guess what? It's going to continue to go on until Jesus comes and we sit at the Lord's Supper table with Him. Hallelujah! Guys, it's not something to take lightly. We are literally remembering the sacrifice of Jesus. Now, I want to show you four things that we're proclaiming until He comes. What are we proclaiming, Pastor? Well, the first thing is you're proclaiming the incarnation of Jesus. Jesus became a man. We're going to, y'all didn't know we were going to talk about Christmas, did you? I like Christmas, don't y'all? I like everything about it, but the best thing is Jesus. Gumbo don't have anything on Jesus. Amen? I like gumbo, but Jesus saved me from my sin. Gumbo made me fat. All right, listen. We proclaim the incarnation of Jesus, the body. Why, why, is, why do we remember the body? Well, God became a man. Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6, For unto us a child is born, and unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulders, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, and Prince of Peace. We are remembering this morning that God became a man, and that body was given for the forgiveness of our sin. Colossians chapter 1 says this, For in Him all the fullness of, was pleased to dwell. God was pleased to dwell. He was not part God. He was God. Fully God, fully man, born of the Holy Spirit. You know what? Whenever I'm leading somebody to Jesus, I always I said, look, and, and we've gone through the gospel, and if I've led you to Jesus, you've heard this before. I, go, I get to the last point right before they pray to receive Christ. I said, I'm going to ask you a few basic questions. I said, are you ready? And they said, yeah. And I say, do you, and they've just talked, we've just talked about God, we've just talked about the gospel, they've shown affirmation that they believe these things, but I make one last appeal to them. I look at them and I say something like this. I say, do you believe in God? Yes, I believe in God. Do you believe that Jesus is God's Son? Yes, I believe Jesus is God's Son. Do you believe that Jesus died on the cross for your sin? Do you believe you're a sinner? Yes. Do you believe that He was resurrected on the third day? Yes, I believe it. And one of the last things I ask them, I say, do you believe in the virgin birth? Do you believe that it was the Holy Spirit that was conceived inside of Mary and gave birth to God? Do you believe that? The incarnation, my friend, whenever you take the Lord's table, whenever you come to that, you've got to remember the incarnation. The body was God Himself. God came down So we could come up. Proclaim the incarnation. Proclaim that Jesus became a man. He came for this purpose to die. For my soul is troubled. John chapter 12 says that I shall say, Father, what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour, but for this purpose I have come to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Then... The voice came from heaven. I love when God talked, when the Father talked to Jesus, the Son. Don't y'all love that? Like whenever John the Baptist baptized him and said, this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. And then on Mount Transfiguration, God said, look, this is God. You need to listen to Him. Wake up. Peter, James, and John, quit trying to build a tent over here and hang out all day. You need to listen to what Jesus had to say. I love it when God the Father spoke to God the Son and He said this, I have glorified it and I will glorify it again. Hallelujah. 
Second thing we need to proclaim. Let us proclaim not only the incarnation of Jesus, but let us proclaim the sacrificial death of Jesus. Whenever you take that, that bread and you understand that it was the incarnation of God, God became a man. Also, you've got to remember that that body was sacrificed for us. The body and the blood. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 2 says, For I have decided, Paul said, to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. The b- broken bread reminds us of Christ's body given for us. The cup reminds us of the shed blood. We must remember that He died thus to be a part of the gospel message. You need to understand to proclaim the gospel message. You have to tell people. I preached a funeral yesterday. You know what I told them? Jesus died for you. I preached, I preached. Guys, let me just tell you something. I I wasn't going to go here, but I'm going to go here really quickly. Yesterday, we buried somebody. Last Saturday, I married somebody. You don't have no idea what's coming to you. Mr. Johnny, three weeks ago, was planning a vacation. You have no idea what's coming. And it, the fact that I'm marrying and burying people is, is really in my heart this morning. And if you don't know Jesus, you must repent. You have to. You're about to meet God one day. And what are you going to say? God, I went to church a couple times. I gave a little bit in the offering plate. I read my Bible every once in a while. I gave a few gifts at Christmas. No, if the blood is not applied to you, you will not be allowed into heaven You must be born again. Has your life ever changed? Get out of religious routine and get into Jesus, my friend. Lord, how mercy. we got to recognize time is short and Jesus is coming. We've got to remember the death of Jesus. Remember why He died. He died for our sins to be the substitute, paying the penalty, the debt that we could not pay. Remember how He died. He died willingly and meekly, showing forth His love. Like the song that we were singing, as He's dying, He's giving forgiveness. He's giving forgiveness. He bore in His body the sins of the world. Proclaim the death of Jesus. Tell people that Jesus died for them. Isn't it strange that that we go through life and we honestly, we try to forget people's death, but Jesus says, I want you to remember my death because I died for you. I died for you. I, I think it's just remarkable that we spend all our lives sometimes trying to channel death out when actually Jesus said, you know, precious in my sight is the death of my saints. And Jesus says, remember my death. Because I died in your place. It should have been like the song that we were singing. It should have been your hands stretched out. Your arms stretched out. Number three, let us proclaim the resurrection of Jesus. Do y'all see how we're going here? Like the incarnation, the sacrificial death, and now Jesus didn't stay in the tomb. He's been raised from the dead. Praise God, Jesus is alive. Hallelujah, hallelujah. We should never remember. Matter of fact, I want to go ahead and make a statement. If the tomb is empty, the church house should be full. Amen? Lord, and churches are closing the doors every day. If the tomb is really empty, and guess what it is, why are the churches not full? Why are people not crying out to God saying, thank you God for the incarnation, the sacrificial death, and the blessed resurrection of Jesus Christ? 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 4 through 6, For I have decided to know, I've, I've, sorry, for I have delivered to you, first of all, in first importance, what I have also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scripture, that He was buried and was raised on the third day in accordance with the Scripture, and that He appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve, then He appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, Though some have fallen asleep. Look, you don't have to doubt the empty tomb. Nobody can, look at, y'all lean in close really quickly. Nobody has ever found Jesus' body. Why? Because he's still alive. Praise God. Nobody has come up and said, I found him. I found his tomb. Nobody. Because he's not there. He's alive. 
We are proclaiming the empty tomb. Jesus is alive and we are still proclaiming the good news until Jesus returns. Don't look at the cross, my friend. I don't, can I go ahead and make a statement really quickly? And nothing against our Catholic brothers and sisters, but I want to tell you something. I don't like to see a cross with Jesus on it. He's not there anymore. I go in Providence Hospital and it kind of turns my stomach a little bit. I love them. I love my brothers and sisters that are Catholic, but I want to tell you something. I don't mind looking at a cross, but I don't want to see a cross with Jesus on it because he's not there anymore. He was there. He was put in a tomb, but the tomb is empty now. The resurrection is why we meet on Sunday, the Lord's Day. Happy Sunday to you, by the way. Number four, the last thing, we proclaim the coming kingdom until Jesus comes. We proclaim the incarnation of Jesus. We proclaim the sacrificial death of Jesus and the resurrection of Jesus. And then we remember that Jesus is coming back. I've always thought it, and every time we've already always taken the Lord's Supper together on Sunday night, I've always made this statement. Wouldn't it be really neat if Jesus came back while we were taking his supper? And like he ushered us from this supper into the great supper with him. And we just pulled away from this table and pulled up to the table with him. Sitting at the, praise God, hallelujah. It's a lot better going from here than the casinos, right? I don't want to go from the casinos. I don't want to meet Jesus in the casinos. I don't want to meet Jesus praising anybody but him. Where'd that come from, Lord? I don't know. But there you go. I want to proclaim the coming kingdom. Matthew 26 says, I tell you, I will not drink again of the fruit of the vine until the day that I drink it anew with you in my Father's house. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till He comes. We should look back at verse 26 and understand when we observe the Lord's Supper, we're doing it until He returns. Jesus is coming back. Yesterday I preached at this funeral just a few hours ago and I preached about Mary and Martha weeping because their, 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 um, their brother Lazarus had passed away. And then there's three words in that Scripture that says Jesus is coming. Jesus was coming and He came into that situation of despair and people weeping. The Jews were weeping. Everybody was sad. And then all of a sudden, Jesus shows up and raises this man from the dead. And said, take his grave clothes, grave clothes off. Unbind him and let him go. I want to tell you something. There's coming a day. Y'all have heard me say this before. Why this college professor stood up before his class and, and he was laughing at Christianity. And he said, why did Jesus call the guy's name Lazarus? And a little Christian student stood up and said, well, look. If he wouldn't have said, Lazarus, come forth, and he just said, come forth, he said every dead person that had already died would come forth. <laughs> he said if he just said, come forth, all the dead would have been raised right then. That's the power of God. I'm telling you, there's coming a day that I will be raised from the dead. I'm going to tell you something. There's coming a resurrection. Read 1 Corinthians chapter 4. Read it. I mean, not 1 Corinthians. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. The trumpet will sound. The dead in Christ will rise first. Then, who, then those that will remain will meet them in the cloud and we will be with the Lord forever. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. Praise God, Jesus is coming back. And we're proclaiming that today. The return of Jesus Christ is the blessed hope of the church and the individual Christian. Jesus not only died for us, but He also was raised for us, ascended into heaven, and one day He will return to take us home to be with Him. Today, we're not all that we should be, but I want to tell you something. There's coming a day that we will be like Him. I love Acts. If y'all want to know one of my favorite scriptures, Acts chapter 1, verse 11. Men of Galilee, angels said to the men of Galilee when, when Jesus ascended back into heaven, the disciples are sitting there saying, okay, what do we do now? Angel come up and said, men of Galilee, why do you stand looking up into heaven? This Jesus, whom was taken up into heaven, will come in the same way as you saw him go up into heaven. Hey, let me just ask you a question. It looks like everybody's looking right now and paying attention. What if Jesus came back right now? How would he find you? Would he find you full of bitterness towards somebody? 
Would he find you daydreaming? Would he find you asleep? He's coming back. Do y'all know the reason why he addressed that issue in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4? Because those people were looking for Jesus to come back at any second. And loved ones, Christians' loved ones were passing away and they were having to put them in the ground and they didn't understand the resurrection. And Jesus, by the inspiration of Jesus, Paul wrote that and said, you don't have to worry, we'll be reunited one day. But my friend, what compelled them to live the Christian life, they were looking for their Savior at any moment. They were waiting on the knock on the door. Y'all ever waited for a knock? Somebody call you and tell you they'll be be there in 15 minutes to, you know, People call our house, call your house, and they say, look, I'll be there in 15 minutes to pick this up from you. You know, I'm borrowing this, or I'm bringing you something. A cake would be nice. And, and, um, and, they, <laughs> and they, they, you're waiting on that knock on the door, and then 15 minutes gets there, and 16 minutes, we're like in the 16th minute right now. We know it's going to happen, but when's the knock coming? When's the sky going to split open? Jesus is coming. So what do we do? How do we prepare for the Lord's Supper? I want to give you four things that we must do at the altar call here in just a second. We must do. We must be reconciled with God. Reconciliation and relationship with God. And what I mean by those two words is this. You must be born again. Who can partake of the Lord's Supper? Those who are washed in the blood of Jesus. Those who are born again. If you're not born again, please be born again before you go to that table because 1 Corinthians says that there are many sick and ill among you because whenever you do this, you don't do it in a worthy manner. And listen, God, you defame and and bring about judgment upon yourself. Don't do this unless you know Jesus. And also you are in relationship or fellowship with Him. All sin is forgiven. You know what? I'm going to go ahead and say this. In just a minute, we're going to have an altar call slash invitation. Every single person in this, this room should be kneeled down if you can physically kneel. If you can't physically kneel, you need to be standing up, lifting your hands up to heaven, saying, God, thank you for forgiveness. If there is any unconfessed sin in my life, forgive me. Forgive me. Continual repentance. Continual repentance. It's, look. People say, I ask people sometimes, have you ever asked the Lord to forgive you? Yeah, I've done that. You know what? I have to do it every day. Every day. Continual repentance. Reconciliation with people. Who is that person? He said, whenever you come together, I hear that there are divisions among you, and in part, I believe it. That shouldn't be so. In other words, reconcile as much, according to first, or, uh, Romans chapter 12, as much as depends upon you, live at peace with all people. Be reconciled. How can you come to this table and say, God, I love you, but I hate this person? It don't work like that. You were an enemy of God, and God forgave you. Number four. Focus or refocus on what's important. Don't come to the table with all your priorities messed up. In other words, don't come with idols. Lay your idols down and refocus on what's important. Amen? That's the gospel. That's what it says in verse 26. As often as you drink this, you proclaim, you tell the Lord's death until He comes. Keep on doing it, Brandon. Keep on doing it, Wade Baptist Church. We're going to keep on doing it. Until He arrives, until He comes. This then is the heart of worship. It is the defined component of our worship. The clearest proclamation of the gospel of redemption. Every time Jewish people celebrated Passover, they proclaimed that they watched their God redeem them. That He split the Red Sea. That He, he, he fed them manna from heaven. They led, were led by a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. They proclaimed it with, the, with Passover. Now, whenever we proclaim Christian, just like the children of Israel, now we proclaim that our God saved us from our sin. That he, our God became a man. He sacrificed His life. He was raised to walk in, in a, a new life. And, my friends, and... We do this until He comes. So that's what's about to happen. Lord's table, we proclaim our God is a Redeemer. And He redeemed us through the incarnate Christ who died in our place. And that's the purpose of the Lord's table.